Good afternoon to everybody. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Bon. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Dujan. Uh, we are here today for the BLED Strategic Forum series. It's uh, a new series of the talks, and it's uh, titled Overture to the Future. Act one today is Young Voices on the Future of Europe. And we will have conversations with two eminent uh, and uh, important persons. Uh, it's uh, our host uh, here, uh, who is State Secretary, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Gaspar Dojan, State Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and French uh, Minister of State for European Affairs, uh, Clement Bon. Uh, again, welcome to Slovenia, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. But what we will talk about today, what is really the overture to the future? Basically, we will talk about where we are heading with the European Union. But to see where we are heading, in front of the important conference that will start next uh, in, in May, we have to say something where we do we stand right now. What's the state of Europe? And we can say that in a very tight time, uh, European Union has faced several crises. It went through financial migration crisis, Brexit. And however, the biggest and the worst crisis situation is still going on. And it's happening right now and it's COVID-19 pandemic, which affects the situation in a social, economic, political structure, basically all the whole world, Europe, European Union, its members, but also each of us individuals. And this crisis causes a great dynamism, both in Europe and in relations in the world. Uh, we are, Europe is basically with neighborhood, with the international relations in front of the serious challenges. And uh, during these crisis years, the EU has changed, has adapted, has transformed. But this crisis, the health crisis, definitely brings the biggest test on the hours. This means European operation, both in a multilateral world that might happen with a new leadership in the United States or in a space of multipolar player competition. And we have to ask whether it's a true cliche. Is it really takes only a crisis for Europe to act or can we operate on a more strategic basis? And here, I mean that if European Union would like to assert its standards, its values, the European Union must build its own crisis resilience, strategic production, production sovereignty in health, economic, social, defense, cybersecurity. Basically, some would say yes, but I think not. European Union cannot operate just on a basis of soft power, but it will have to develop also a hard power. The post-crisis economic recovery with uh, comprehensive recovery plan that shows mutual solidarity in the European Union can only be achieved probably through a radical disruptive change of the economic model towards a green and digital economy. Production sovereignty and human rights based supply and value chains are necessary part of this transition as is social Europe which has to deal also with the negative effects of the globalization. European way of life, our values required an urgent agreement on management of migration, asylum, functioning of Schengen, but above all, it requires a well-functioning common understanding of the rule of law. Functioning European democracy, transparency and subsidiarity are of utmost importance, not to mention investments <coughs> into the, into the into the artificial intelligence, uh, 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 which open a new, uh, a new area of, comp of uh, competitiveness. And this is the, the, the space which European Union probably should enter into. The differences between West and Eastern part of the European Union, we cannot neglect them. They're here, but probably we have to find some compromise, some common understanding if we would like to strengthen further the European Union. 
The EU model still attracts many of them, both in Europe and in the world. But we have also non-friendly ri rivals with different values from ours. An expanded European Union's influence and effectiveness in managing, managing of the global processes and also regional processes means also dealing with the enlargement process and political stabilization of Western Balkans and the Mediterranean, together with important participation of the transatlantic partnership. The citizens' expectations regarding Europe, especially its effectiveness, have increased, especially on heard challenges, and we should not underestimate them. According to the latest Eurobarometer from this year, from this month, 92% of Europeans demand that their voice on the future of Europe is respected. Bottom-up dialogue, consultations with citizens will start. What is their opinion? What is the opinion of the European citizens? What matters for, to, for them? Will politics listen to them? Because we had several debates in the past year, but basically we didn't transfer the results of the opinion of citizens into European politics. How the results of the conference will be transformed into this without risking the credibility of the European Union. And uh, the important part of this conference will be also communication management. If we want, we would not like to repeat the mistakes that we did with some other previous conferences of that type. But again, these questions will try and will be answered by the newest conference on the future of Europe, starting in Strasbourg on May, the, uh, 9 May, and will last till spring next, next year. And I would like to remind you that also BLED Strategic Forum of this year, in September 1st and 2nd, will deal with the future of Europe and in fact, it is entitled Future of Europe. Uh, young voices are in the heart of this debate on Future of Europe and today's debate of our panel. Uh, young will shape their future, their and ours European Union. And uh, I'm very glad that we will have the discussions. And now I would like to just to present briefly our two, uh, two interlocutors. First, Gaspar Dujan, as I said, his state secretary in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Slovenia. He was legal advisor to Slovenian delegation to the Intergovernmental Conference on the Constitution of Europe. He used to be Prime Minister's Councillor for the European and International Relations, and he collaborated in the Slovenian EU presidency in 2008. He holds several positions in the Slovenian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and was posted also in Berlin as a diplomat. And if I may say so, he will be also member of the executive committee of the conference of, uh, uh, on future of Europe. Uh, Mr. Dojan will present priorities of Slovenian EU presidency of which also in the second half of this year of which of course important part will be also uh, debate on the future of Europe. Clement Bon, French Minister of State for European Affairs, if I may say so, a very convinced European uh, he was European Union Sherpa, special advisor to French President Macron. Uh, he also participated, if you know right, speech, uh, Sorbonne speech in 2017. Uh, he was with Mr. Macron already in times when Mr. Macron was Minister of Economy, Industry and Digital Sector. Uh, he is a writer of European part of election program of Enmars. Uh, he holded several positions in French government administration. And he presented his European vision in a very interesting essay, which is a must uh, 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 to read for everybody that deals with the European uh, uh, affairs, uh, entitled Europe after COVID from September last year. Uh, some would say that Mr. Bon uh, is author of a new changed method of French operations in Europe, as would some would say, by not acting French, they've made EU more French. And uh, it seems that Mr. Bourne, in uh, brief uh, words, um, sees Franco-German motto as the basis of successful and reinvigorated European Union project. Um, I think there is a little, very little space uh, for smaller member states in this vision, but uh, you will correct me if I'm not wrong, but still, France says 
that sh they should talk to everybody. And the sovereignty of the European Union is based basically on three pillars, independence, power, identity. These are also pillars of the public opinion that we uh, saw among the participants of today's panel and in some Eurobarometer uh, findings. Realistic concept of power and autonomy is again in European debate. Sovereign geopolitical self-empowered European Union means also that is not against sovereign member states, but is a part of the sovereign member, member states. Equidistance from great powers is not approach of power and new European model would join power with cooperation and balance individual liberty with a collective solidarity. Europe is not Europe of clubs, but project teams or flexible alliances in differentiated formats. And political Europe needs, which this is very interesting and very openly said, defined borders, functioning institutions, power agenda, and sense of belonging. Enlargement process is a reversible process, according to your essay, where, where, where I read it. Uh, uh, and this is part that is interesting for Slovenia, uh, is a reversible political process. And there are some last tickets for the Western Balkans for the European Union. And uh, Europe must evolve from merely being an area to a real power. Europe must offer, but at the same time protect and institutions should adapt. And these are all terms and topics that will be discussed in the Conference on Future of Europe, and, we'll, and we'll, which will give a sort of compass uh, for future development and significance of Europe in the world. Of course, there are, there, these are also important parts of the French EU presidency, which will happen in 2022 uh, under motor recovery power belonging, but now, I will finish myself. I didn't introduce myself. I'm Istok Mirosic. I'm pro ambassador in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and at the same time humble program, uh, uh, director of programs of the Blessed Strategic Forum. Uh, I will finish here and uh, I will give the floor first to Mr. State Secretary Dojan uh, to present us uh, uh, some views on the Slovenian presidency and uh, some views on the future of Europe uh, debate. And after that to uh, Minister uh, uh, bon, please, uh, State Secretary Dojan, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ambassador Mirosic, and thank you also for this introduction and analysis. I pretty much agree with uh, the analysis that has been presented. Um, it, it is true that we are facing, as, as Europe, quite a number of challenges. The fact is that we have gone through um, a series of crises, but none of the uh, none of the crises has really been finished. We are speaking about migration crisis, a financial crisis, uh, Brexit. Uh, we are now facing pandemic, and of course, in the midst of this um, crisis management, uh, there is a, a sense that uh, the Europe really should debate its future, should seek ways to improve its resilience, and of course, seek also dialogue with citizens. Because we know that uh, during this crisis management, a lot of decisions have been taken to combat uh, the consequences of those crises that weren't necessarily um, um, uh, uh, substantiated with democratic legitimacy. So basically, uh, it is fully understandable that there's a gap between, or increasing gap between, uh, on one hand, European elite, political and economic elite that fights various um, crises, on one hand, and on the other, uh, citizens that are losing uh, trust because there are so many uh, things that have happened that may not be fully understandable. And of course, uh, this is in this context, of course, is, uh, it is very welcome that we are 
having now the conference on the future of Europe. Um, and that uh, the conference will be, of course, an organized um, and structured platform to debate our future. It will enable the member states, the European Parliament, the national parliaments, and all other stakeholders, including citizens, to present their views. And of course, it will also ensure that political elite will make analysis and seek ways how to uh, implement the recommendations that will be presented by all those stakeholders and that will also be perceived as, as good uh, solutions for the future. Uh, this is a tremendous responsibility for all of us that will be uh, part of the conference. And uh, I hope we will, uh, of course, also as presiding country in the second half of this year, do our utmost to uh, um, enhance the work of the conference to be inclusive, but also uh, efficient. Uh, as we initially, when we, are, when we were preparing our priorities, we decided to have four main uh, pillars of priorities. The first one, uh, we decided to be resilience because we see, I already spoke about all those crises and we said, we have to see what we can do in order to improve resilience of the European Union in order to establish mechanisms of better coordination for confrontation with all those crises such as pandemics, but also others like um, cyber uh, glo attacks of, of global significance and so on. And the second one is of course, um, economic recovery. We all know how um, difficult time it is for our economies, especially for young people, because it's very difficult to get on the market to seek work. Um, it's also very difficult to um, finish school. So very difficult time. And we have to see what we, and how we can improve the life of the people and how we can use all those funds that were um, agreed upon to um, ensure the European Union and the Europe as such gets new improved um, economic model that will be smart, uh, more digital, but also green and, and clean. And this is, uh, and this, the, third, the third priority for us, of course, was um, um, what we can do in order to um, address the question of European life. Uh, what is this? What, uh, and uh, we discussed a lot about this priority. And of course we said, of course we, we have challenges. We, we have seen, now we have a French guest and the French has been so um, um, hurt by terrorist attacks, for example. And the biggest question is how to preserve basic liberties, fundamental rights, when we are facing such threats. And of course, when we are debating migration uh, uh, questions, when we are debating um, reform of the Schengen uh, acquis, uh, all, these are all questions that we have to address and to ensure that we find common denominator. Uh, we all know how important it is to preserve basic um, freedoms such as freedom of movement, but all, all other freedoms and uh, this is so important also uh, in the context of, 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 of the future. And uh, rule of law has already been mentioned. This is all part this, of this debate. It is obviously that in Europe we have quite, uh, quite some differences because member states have different models also constitutionally and uh, it has become um, a uh, very topical subject to debate this, but for the future, it is very important that we ensure that we are able to understand each other better 
and that we have converging process when it comes to common values. And uh, this is very important for future. If we are not able to improve cohesion, also when it comes to values, then uh, at certain point, uh, we may expect even bigger problems. So this is our third pillar of priorities. And the fourth one is uh, related to our third partners. Um, for us, it is of course of tremendous importance that we work on reinvigorating the transatlantic link is a spinal cord, so to say, of, of, of EU uh, future, uh, because it connects the most important countries uh, with similar values that are challenged in the world. And this is why we believe we have to build this link stronger, uh, also uh, in questions of security, but also uh, trade and or other related issues. Um, but the other um, aspects when it comes to relations to third countries, of course, um, are uh, or relate to our immediate neighborhood. Uh, I'm speaking about Eastern neighbors, um, Southern neighbors. We have a lot of challenges. On one side, when it comes to Eastern neighborhood, we have challenged post-Westphalian European or world order. When it comes to the Southern neighborhood, we have challenges uh, of migration, but also um, a life of those people in dignity. And I think Europe has a lot to offer and can do more in order to contain, not only to contain migration flow, but also to help um, the people that flee to Europe to see their future at home. And I think that here there are tremendous opportunities, but we have to address these issues also with other partners, third countries that uh, are um, in a position also to contribute to this, to this goal. And to finish the priorities, of course, Ambassador Mirosic has already mentioned enlargement uh, and the perspective of, of the countries in the region, it is for us strategically very important, but also if we consider uh, the, his the historical, uh, historically, uh, and the whole development, how it came to the First World War and everything, and we end up with a situation in the Western Balkans. And this is why uh, it is of, for reasons of, of course, security uh, of tremendous importance, and some of some of uh, think tanks are developing various ideas for the region, but we believe it is very clear that the region has uh, membership, EU membership perspective, uh, which is not only for the EU to deliver, of course, but also for them. But when it comes to crisis and crisis management, I think that we have to think even in broader terms and see how we can work together, even if they are not members of the European Union. Uh, when it comes to major crises, if we are not working hand in hand with uh, the states of the Western Balkans, then we are just importing instability. And this is, um, this is very uh, important notion because we have seen how, especially pandemic, uh, how um, the, also the third actors used this vulnerability and, um, of course, played against European interests in the region. And I think we have to think strategically and uh, find ways to help the region, of course, uh, if necessary, also to develop new instruments uh, in order to ensure stability it is so important also, I think, for we, since we have French guests, uh, when we are speaking of, of security, terrorism, and if we think back how it came to also to, to the incidents in France, we end up with a sort of involvement also, uh, geographically speaking, of the, of the region. Uh, so, and this is, of course, uh, 
something we have to work on to improve uh, uh, and to, to um, ensure to export stability instead of importing instability. And uh, just, just to finish with our obviously fifth priority um, now, we, since we have agreement on the conference on the future of Europe, we will of course be active and try to do everything within our power to facilitate the process. It will probably not be the platform to um, present only our views, uh, but within the council, we will have a special role as a presiding country to coordinate um, positions and to present also the council as as institution and and try to uh, integrate the views of the member states and present them in the dialogue with other institutions so here um, I, I will conclude and uh, i will be more than happy to answer any of of questions later thank you mr state secretary um minister bon would you explain to us how we will make power from European Union or how European Union will become a power, real power in the world, how we will be sense, sense, sensitive for the belonging to the European Union. I uh, just want to remind you that uh, when we talked to the students uh, before this panel, um, they expressed uh, as among the challenges of Europe, uh, uh, more or less this, uh, what they are seeing is health, environment, democracy, migration, and then unity, solidarity, values, power, identity, economy, employment, and efficiency. This is my, uh, my uh, uh, understanding of theirs, uh, counting how, how many times they named uh, certain things. But uh, let's say, uh, give us a vision of uh, European Union that we will strive uh, with other forces in the world. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, very happy to be, uh, as you said, for the first time in, uh, in Slovenia, in Ljubljana, and uh, very happy to be on this panel with Minister Dovshan and to uh, wanted to thank also the, the Blade Strategic Forum for making this uh, possible and to have this exchange. I think we would uh, all have liked to have a more, if I can say, lively or direct discussion, uh, not through a screen, but that's what we have to deal with uh, in this health crisis still at the moment. Maybe I would uh, try to, um, as you did, as you did, Ambassador, start from the lessons we can, we should draw from the crisis, to see how we can build the future. When uh, we look at exactly a year or nearly of, of crisis now, of COVID crisis, which was a, a kind of a huge surprise, big shock. It's not gone, unfortunately. Even if through vaccination we are seeing a, a glimpse of hope and I hope more than I hope more than a glimpse in the coming weeks but we saw how the EU reacted well or badly uh, de depending on the areas depending on the moments in this crisis and I think it says a lot about our political projects when you look at the uh, economic side of this crisis to start with this uh, we saw very quickly uh, a strong reaction from the EU and I think we as you mentioned, went through a lot of crises over the last 10, 12 years. Um, migration crisis, the Brexit crisis, the financial and debt crisis before. And when we compare the reaction to the previous economic crisis to the one we had during uh, this crisis, I think we improved a lot. Uh, a year ago, exactly, uh, the European Commission took some uh, strong measures to make sure we can react economically to the uh, difficult situation, suspending fiscal rules, suspending state aid rules, and so on. The central bank for the Eurozone reacted very strongly as well. And uh, we discussed, uh, starting uh, nearly exactly a year ago, to discuss a recovery plan, which was decided the last summer, uh, in a few weeks, actually, in a few months, four months, uh, which is the biggest economic package of the history of the EU which now we have to, of course, deliver, implement, make work. But uh, I think it's a, it's a very strong proof that we can avoid to do too little too late as we did the past. When I try to uh, look at the rest, health, 
other elements related to uh, the virus spreading borders, freedom of movement, I must say that the European reaction was less positive. I, should, I think we should be fair as well here uh, and, and see also the positive aspects that uh, we were able to develop and implement. But to be frank, we were not probably up to the challenge. Why do I think? Because it's an area, health in particular, and this is a strong health crisis, in which the EU was not equipped with a budget, with competencies, with a health equipment, uh, with a, just a habit, a process of dealing with health crisis as national governments or local governments are used to do. Of course, this crisis was a shock and a surprise for everyone across the world, but in the EU, we did not have the tools to deal with it ourselves. I'm not saying that would be probably too simple that when the EU has the competency, it does well. When the EU does not have the competency, it doesn't cope. It's probably a bit more complex than that, but I think there is some truth in this, which should lead us to rethink the areas in which we act and the competencies we develop. I don't believe, to make a link between the crisis and the future, I don't believe that this idea that we had in the past, subsidiarity, listing competencies and so on, works very well. Because two years ago, a year and a half ago, if we, if, if we would have been here, if we would have had a debate at the European level about what should be our priorities, our challenges, no one would have mentioned health. It would have been seen as quite ridiculous to say, I have a big plan, this is health for Europe, we should have a competency, we should buy um, some masks or produce uh, vaccines or anticipate on new vaccination technologies and so on. Everybody would have laughed and say, guys, it's about defense, it's about climate, it's about whatever, which it's relevant. But we see now that health is extremely powerful in this European agenda or global agenda. So I think it's too artificial, I would say, to try to draw a list of competencies for local governments, national governments, EU. I do think that in every area, when there is a big shock, a big challenge, we need some elements of EU response. Does not mean that the EU should do everything. For health, for instance, I don't believe one second that EU should manage from Brussels, uh, our hospitals in Slovenia, in France, in Spain, or wherever. I don't think it could work. But when it comes to uh, buying vaccines, I know all the debates we have now about this, but I do think that it was a good idea, it is a good idea, to go to the EU level. We have difficulties now, production, deliveries, but I don't think that any of these difficulties would be better solved alone at the national level. And actually, it's quite interesting to see when some EU countries at the moment trying sometimes, I can understand, to find pragmatic solutions to the health crisis, knocked on the door of Russia, China, others, and said, we should find alternative solutions to EU framework, EU solidarity. They saw very quickly that it was not the best solution. And no one went out of the European framework of vaccination, east or west, north or south, big or small countries, no one. I think it says something about the fact that this framework is not perfect. We should definitely improve it, but we need it. This is a good example, health, uh, of an area in which we need European action, but not exclusive European action. Maybe to go back to uh, the articles you were kind enough, Ambassador, to mention, I still think actually these uh, four elements of reflection or action should try to lead us in the uh, aftermath of the crisis thinking about Europe. Institutions, I think you have no political projects with uh, dysfunctional institutions. I think we have a powerful set of institutions in Europe. Maybe we would go back to this. I think we should differentiate more what we do in the EU policy by policy, but I do think we should keep our institutional set, commission, council, parliament. We will not invent a new European commission because we have a, a more limited cooperation for Eurozone or for Schengen or whatever. I think we need to keep these institutions. It is our common protection. But probably there are reforms to be discussed. Personally, I would tend to say that uh, uh, the commission is probably too big at this moment. Uh, probably I would argue that uh, on some areas we need to have within the European Parliament some formats of discussion which are ad hoc, 
for euro, for instance, I don't think it would be a bad idea. I would think it's a good idea to have a, a kind of a European uh, Eurozone format sorry, in the European Parliament to discuss specific issues as we have Eurogroup for ministers uh, and so on and so forth. For instance, for borders, migration, Schengen is a, an important club, EU as well, but Schengen is a specific uh, club. Uh, there's no uh, meeting of interior ministers of the Schengen member states, which are not all EU member states, but some extra EU member states. So that would be a good idea. I think in the future, we would, we would need to invent some form of coordination with the UK for foreign policy, for instance. We can imagine this type of uh, uh, formats that we need to uh, invent, keeping the institutional uh, sets we have at the moment. You mentioned borders. I think it's uh, controversial, but very important. I, I think if we want to uh, feel that the EU is a political project, a political community. We need to be clear about this uh, debate about enlargement, who belongs or should belong to the club or not, or where it stops. I do believe, I know it was one of the areas of debate, sometimes controversies between France and Slovenia, but to be clear, I do believe that all countries of the Western Balkans should become member state of the European Union. Uh, we may come back to the conditions, to the process, to the modalities, but I do think it, it should happen. I do think it will happen. I also think that we need reforms to be made in these countries to join, of course, as we are all expecting from them. And that the EU, probably even more important, should be more efficient before they do join. Otherwise, we will just expand a club which is not functioning well. But I think they have their place in the club in the EU, for reasons we can go back to, but I, I, do think so, I do think so. As Gasper said, I think it's a matter of security, a matter of stability for us and for the region. But I also think that after this, we should be clear that, I mean, maybe in 50 years it will be different, but we should stop being obsessed about finding where the borders are. I think we need stability in this respect. We need to be clear that the club is defined with institutions and borders. Uh, I think the EU will never become a state, a kind of equivalent of a, a nation state, but it needs to have this stability of any political community with borders and institutions. You also mentioned uh, the element I insist on in this uh, article you, you quoted, uh, a power roadmap or power strategy for the EU. I think it will be here again very important after the crisis. We discovered during the crisis that power or autonomy is not only about uh, defense, is not only about military aspects, is not only about high technologies. It's sometimes about being able to produce uh, face masks, respirators, to develop our own vaccine and so on. Elements which are probably more uh, abundant that we thought, sometimes more simple as well. Uh, Yes, strategic autonomy is also about having the ability to produce masks and not to ask China to deliver all of them to us for obvious reasons that we discovered last spring. Uh, so we will have here again to rethink the areas in which Europe, EU and member states jointly, we need to do more. And I think to produce more, I do think there is no autonomy with a, a weakness in the production process. We need more industrial uh, champions, no, more innovators, more ability to produce medicines and so on in Europe. It doesn't mean that we will produce uh, ourselves everything we need, which we are a trading club. It's very important. It, of course, does not mean even more than each member state will be able to produce these elements. It would be totally silly and irrealistic. But we need to have a better economic industrial strategy based on the single market after the crisis, I think it's an element of autonomy beyond the elements of defense, foreign policy, uh, technologies that I was uh, mentioning. And actually, I think solidarity and sovereignty, we will probably need more solidarity after the crisis in the club, are very closely linked. When you are not sovereign, when you are not autonomous, when you are not able to product more, you are not able to provide solidarity within the family. We saw that again last year uh, when we were all lacking masks, 
we are all fighting each other on asking China to provide and to deliver each member state first. If we had been able to produce ourselves more quickly, this problem would not have happened. Why do we have a debate now? Even if, as I said, I think it's less important these days, about finding vaccines outside the EU, and some member states have been tempted to do so, because we have some problems of deliveries in the EU. If we were able to produce faster in the EU, we would not have this issue. So when you are not sovereign, autonomous in the key areas, you are not able to keep the solidarity together. I think it goes really hand in hand. And finally, as you mentioned, Ambassador, I do believe in this uh, sense of belonging in the EU. Uh, sometimes when we are drawing um, programs for presidency as Slovenia and France are doing at the moment, uh, in the very end you tick a box which is uh, culture, education, uh, mobility, whatever, uh, this sense of belonging. Uh, I think we should put it at the top of the list because nobody is supporting the EU because the economic policy is efficient. Of course, as I developed, it's a, an important condition. It's a necessity to make sure the EU is accepted and relevant uh, and to develop our agenda in other areas like health, of course. But no political project, no political community can survive if we are just about efficiency, public policies and common projects. We need a sense of a common culture, of a common community, of a common sense towards the future. And this can be done through a lot of different manners, from Erasmus uh, to a, a stronger cultural policy at the EU level, uh, to developing our own model of regulating the digital sector, for instance. I think it's a very powerful tool of European identity. But we need to work on this. And I hope the conference in the future on Europe, of Europe would involve the young generation you will uh, reflect about this because we need this type of uh, common perspectives. Uh, I, I, I said, I think in this article or maybe somewhere else, that uh, when you are an American president or Chinese president, uh, you go to TV and you say, my country will be the first to go on March on planet Mars or to be uh, very strong in space area or whatever. If a president of the European Commission or president of the European Council would go on TV in Slovenia, in France, in Germany, in Belgium, wherever in Europe and say, I think the Europeans should be first to put a foot on Mars, I think everybody would laugh here again. But why? We are leading in the space industry. We are leading in a lot of high technological area. We are leading in a lot of future oriented industries or sectors as Europeans together. Why should we avoid or forbid ourselves to have positive long-term future projects? Why don't we say in 2030, 2040, 2050, we will be the leading force in green economy, the leading force in space industry, the leading force in uh, 5G or 6G or 7G, whatever it is now, whatever it will be, it will be at the time. Uh, we should not, as Europeans, think that our cooperation should be only about managing crises, about uh, reducing the level of difficulties and tensions between each other. We should have this dream of common European projects for the next 10, 20, 30 years. All big powers in the world have elements of power, clear institutions, clear borders, and this common project for the future. I think we lack this in Europe. We have all the resources to develop this. Probably sometimes we lack enthusiasm and envy. And I hope after the crisis, we will feel this need for a common long-term project even more. And I do hope that our two presidencies in the coming year would contribute to this. Of course, it will certainly not, certainly not be enough. So we need you and we count on you to also have these European dreams for the future, because as we do know, as you do know, it all started with crazy dreams. I was, I was having a few uh, pupils in uh, my ministry a few days ago in Quai d'Orsay in Paris, uh, and I always insist on one room, which is called the Salon de l'Horloge, because there's a big clock, horloge. And it's exactly where 71 years ago, 
a guy called Robert Schumann made a declaration saying we will be together, at least France and Germany, and then as we know it extended, to avoid five years after the Second World War only to kill each other again. Uh, now it seems obvious, sometimes boring, but at the time it was a crazy long-term dream and project. We need to find, I don't have the answer, and I think you should have the answer as a younger generation, but we should find the two, three, four, five dreams of this kind for the next years, not forgetting what we achieved. Peace, reconciliation, enlargement, united Europe is already an achievement of this dream, but we should go further now and keep this sense of hope in the future. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Minister. Uh, I would just uh, now turn to uh, audience and ask them to um, uh, give comments or questions. Uh, you should wave by hands or put on a chat uh, uh, that you would like to ask uh, uh, or State Secretary Dojan or uh, Minister uh, Bonn. Uh, uh, I hope that there will be a lot of interesting uh, uh, questions uh, and pl please do it as you uh, fast as you as you uh, as you can. Um, uh, in the meantime, uh, I would just uh, remind one thing, uh, uh, um, and this is, uh, I would like to turn again back to Eurobarometer and just remind of very interesting data. 76% of Europeans think that Conference on Future of Europe will have a positive effect on European democracy, 76. That means that if they will be disillusioned, uh, if uh, their ideas will not be put into the future politics or will not be uh, uh, counted in the, in the political bodies of the European Union and institutions and also policies of the member uh, countries, that might be a severe setback for the European Union. So this is a high expectation that the voice of the people and young will be uh, respected at the end of the day. Uh, seven, uh, 47 think that young people should have important and active role in the in the conference of uh, uh, on future of Europe, uh, but do they have really a representative? I'm I'm not sure about about that. Uh, just 51 uh, percent, which is uh, more than half, but still 51 percent, would like to be included actively and personally. Uh, in the debate on future of Europe. And Slovenia here is on the fourth place by 63% after the Irish with ATN, Belgians and Luxembourgese. 60% uh, 60 of uh, 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 admit that they, during the COVID crisis, thought more on the future of European Union. So people are concerned about the future of European Union. Uh, and uh, interesting in which direction European Union should develop, very uh, interesting questions. And there are three categories, equality, democracy, and green economy. Equality, meaning uh, uh, equality of living standards, solidarity and health policy, uh, 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 advantages of the European Union regarding democracy, rule of law, and human rights before economic, industrial, and trade power, interesting. and. Uh, 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 challenges that European Union uh, citizens are concerned with are climate change the most, terrorism, health, and migrations. So at the end, 66% of Europeans and 58% of Slovenians are optimistic about the future of Europe. But now I would like to turn to our uh, 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 audience and public, and I have uh, Erasm uh, here, and uh, maybe uh, you can do, you can ask your, by yourself a question, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the presentations. They've, they've been wonderful. Uh, I hope you won't mind, but I have a little more of a systemic question regarding the future of Europe and youth participation. Especially, I'd like to ask you, in what role do you believe that uh, the younger generation should be in the development of Europe? Uh, so do you think they should have an advisory role, a little more productive? Do you think we should aspire to be dreamers? Uh, as has been said, and uh, like most of all, in which functions, roles, or fronts do you think that the youth should be more invested in, should more participate in? Uh, I understood this is a question for both of our participants. Uh, Gashpur, yes, I... for both. Yeah. Well, thank you for this question. I think it's a, it's a good one. First of all, um, um, the youth 
is, uh, I would say, very strong stakeholder. Uh, the first thing the executive committee will have to do on the first meeting is to agree on the setup of the plenary. So there will be probably a possibility to include also representatives of youth. But then, uh, next thing, the European Commission established special digital platform. And that platform will allow also people from all around Europe to participate, to present their view, to have online, cha online chats. So basically it will be a good way to interact also with uh, youth uh, of, of other countries, but also to present views that will be then uh, taken into account uh, by the executive committee. Um, the next uh, question regarding the um, the in, um, the way you should um, interact, I think it's not really on us to 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 answer because it's it's up to you we, because we uh, first of all have to listen and uh, it's up to to you to to decide what you would like to present as, as, as important for future. And I think this is very important when, whenever, I, I already mentioned, we will uh, be dealing with, with big question, how to implement recovery plans and how to ensure jobs and things like that. And it will be very important to have also this insight, what, what is important also for you as, as younger generation. Thank you, uh, Mr. State Secretary, Mr. Minister. Would you like to add something? How to Jesper, engage young people? Jesper said it all about the conference on the future of Europe and how there is a role to be given uh, to uh, the younger generation. Uh, I would add two things, I think. Um, first, we, we should encourage all the policies, all the concrete actions, which give a European experience to the young generation. Of course, it's Erasmus. Uh, I think it would be very good. I was talking about long-term projects. Uh, that uh, we have an ambitious target. We said it. Uh, President Macron said it in the Sorbonne speech, for instance. That in a few years, I don't know, maybe ten, increasing again the budget of the Erasmus program. We make sure that each young European has at least a six months experience somewhere in the EU. Apprenticeship, internship, studies, whatever, wherever. I think leaving some months uh, personal experience somewhere in the EU, leaving your country, being uh, helped for that with uh, money when you don't have enough money and so on. Erasmus, extended Erasmus, generalized Erasmus, it would be great. Because I think if you are interested in EU affairs, was my case as a, as a young guy. It's never because you have a, a lesson in university or in high school about uh, Euro or the EU or Schengen or whatever. It's because you have at some point a personal European experience, reading a book, seeing a film, traveling abroad, having a, somebody coming from another country in your neighborhood, in your family, whatever. At some point you have a, a European experience. And I think developing this is a precondition to have involvement, I think, of the younger generation uh, in, the, in, the, in the European project. And maybe a final comment to say that, to be frank, it's then up to you. I think we should not uh, create a special place or a special box for the younger generation. It's important to have this your generation in the conference, for instance, but then it's up to you uh, be involved in an NGO, in a uh, local association, in politics, in whatever. Uh, you can be European, you can be an European actor through what you decide to push, to promote, uh, through politics, through your economic actions, through your associative actions and so on. Uh, so it's not for, I would say, us <laughs> as politicians, as uh, older people. I, usually think of myself as a young person, but I realize it's not so true now, uh, but it's not for us to give you a place, if I can say, of course, we have a responsibility, but it's for you to, to be involved in whatever sector you feel necessary or useful, if you believe that something should be done about Europe. 
Thank you, Mr. Minister. I think you had a very positive Irish experience regarding the Erasmus, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, the next uh, with us is Yernay. Please uh, uh, have a question and uh, also entitled to a question to whom you would like to, to, to ask, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good day to you all. Uh, my question is uh, pertaining to the EU security. Uh, the question is uh, more focused on uh, uh, the French minister. I would like to ask uh, when this whole uh, epidemic ends and public gatherings open again, we are going to face or, or we are still going to be facing the uh, looming uh, dangers of terrorism that France has uh, been the victim of uh, numerous times in uh, horrid uh, ways, uh, Paris, Nice, uh, many others. I would like to ask, I would like to ask, uh, does the EU have any plans on focusing on tackling the ghettoization and radicalization of uh, individuals that are uh, living in communities that are, more, how to say, so to speak, uh, uh, disconnected from the rest of our European integrated community? Thank you very much. Please. Thank you. It's a difficult question, frankly, because I, I, I tend to think that a lot of the policies we need to uh, tackle terrorism in the broader sense from uh, uh, police or justice action to, before that, integration uh, are based on national tools and policies till now. It will probably, if we are realistic, be the case for the years, maybe decades to come. Um, where do we need more European action? Frankly, I think on the, I would say, hard elements, you mentioned Ambassador Hard Power, uh, security, foreign actions, what we do, for instance, in Sahel, France, but also some EU countries uh, playing some different roles there with us, I think is a matter of European security. And it's a part of the fight against terrorism. On this, it's hard power and hard fight. I think EU or European countries in different formats have to do more, and we have to do more probably. Because as we saw when there were an attack in an attack last November in Austria, for instance, uh, it's not only a matter of a few countries, including France, it's something that can happen all over Europe and it will last. We will not defeat the terrorist threat in, in a few weeks or months, even if we do more at the EU level. So that's an area I would say I would expect, or I would see more EU action or more European action. Um, on the integration and the education and the preventive part of these fights, probably we can do more if we are pragmatic in the short run by exchanging practices, experiences. I was in Austria right after the attacks. We are now trying to uh, cooperate with uh, them on a bilateral basis, but we could extend it totally uh, on uh, how the fights, uh, some uh, uh, behaviors of what we call in French communitarism or separatism, being separate from the rest of society, how we improve our education policy, our training of religious authorities in Europe so that they are not conveying hatred because they are too dependent on external countries and sometimes enemies of Europe. Uh, so it's all this comprehensive set of policies we can probably coordinate better at the EU level. I, I would not say that we could make it, frankly, as pro-European as I am, a uh, common EU policy in the short run. So I, I would be quite pragmatic in these areas, probably do more in the defense hard power side and probably coordinate more on the rest, education, integration on this type of policies in the short run. Thank you. Just, uh, would you like to know? Okay, the next one is uh, Sweet Peterlin, please. Uh. Yes, thank you so much for all of your insights. My question is um, towards the Minister Bond. Uh, you were talking a lot about shared European values and how important they are. And I wonder where do you see a European Union towards the LGBT issues, especially since uh, acceptance of this community is much different in different states or 
example, on one hand, we have France and Germany where acceptance is pretty high. And on the other hand, we have states like Poland where there is not that much of equality. So my question to you is, do you believe that we can achieve a European Union where being a member of LGBT feels safe and equal no matter where you are? Thank you. Yes, thank you. It's, uh, you recall me of my visit to Poland last week. <laughs> um, no, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very important and it's not, uh, and we cannot isolate, I would say, LGBT rights. And I, I think this fight is important because it's about European values, about core principles of the EU uh, uh, that are written in uh, Article 2 of our treaty. So it's, it's not like the last provision of our common base on treaty and agreement. It's right at the forefront of what we agreed to. Um, Non-discrimination, equality, rule of law, and so on. So it is very important because when these rights are withdrawn or reduced in some place, country, region, and in some area, LGBT or whatever, usually, very quickly, all the rights are reduced as well. And I don't want to open a controversy uh, with Poland, it's not the point, but I was there. And you can see that when you have a problem with LGBT rights, for instance, you also have a problem with women's rights and probably with other elements of rule of law. So it's a, it's a, it's, that's why it's so important to defend them as EU common principles. I think the debate has grown a lot in the, in the EU, which is good because all this in the end is political debate, political pressure. Uh, and this is clearly an area in which we cannot differentiate. I never buy the argument that you have different countries with different values, of course. You have national policies, you have national sensitivities, you have national identities. This is all fine and I do respect it. Uh, but you have a common set of values and equality and discrimination is obviously part of them. On this, we cannot be weak. So the debate is higher. Uh, you could see that last week in the European Parliament, for instance, there was a resolution voted to say Europe is a symbol, of course, but is a LGBT freedom zone. Uh, but we should go beyond the messages and the symbols. We have a toolbox to fight against attempts against rule of law, which I think is strengthen, strengthening, strengthen, sorry, being strengthened uh, now. Uh, we have uh, some procedures, proceedings in our treaty. And we increased this, uh, we developed this toolbox a few weeks ago with uh, this conditionality regulation between budget, EU budget funding and some elements of rule of law. This is probably not going far enough, but this is a good example of how the debate is developing, being, becoming more concrete in the EU. And I think we should make it also uh, during the French presidency a, a strong priority not because again, it's a category of rights or some community or whatever, but because it's, it's deeply the EU meaning which is at stake here. And when people, I was struck in France by the intensity of this debate when you open it, when people have the feeling that the EU is not fighting for its values, they don't see the whole meaning and sense of belonging I was mentioning. And then we reduce EU to just a an economic project, a common market, and so on. It's much more obvious. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. The European Union is uh, um, uh, the European Union is, of course, also a union of values. And uh, like Clement said, we have, uh, of course, we have national identities. We have uh, constitutional um, uh, limitations in each and every country. We have various differences. But when it comes to uh, discrimination, we have uh, common uh, principles and we have to stick to it. And uh, I think uh, um, the question was also about security. And I think uh, no member of any minority should not uh, should should be uh, should feel endangered in in what he or she is. So this is basically the all about what what the EU is about. And I think uh, there are all sorts of minorities. Um, uh, and uh, we have uh, also constitutionally uh, two national minorities, for example, we have all or other minorities that not, do not have constitutional protection, but uh, at the end of the day, I think it's uh, human dignity and uh, basic as, as a basic principle. 
and uh, non-discrimination and uh, when it comes to individual um, uh, uh, it is quite clear that uh, in, within the European Union we have uh, we have uh, uh, well we, we function as a value a community of values uh, where people have rights and, and obligations and uh, but basically they have uh, of course they deserve to feel safe whenever they are uh, the way they are uh, thank you um we have also matiz jure uh, with us please matiz uh dear esteemed speakers i would firstly thank you for this opportunity your speeches differed in topic one talking more about security matters and the other one more about uh, cooperation and importance of peace maintenance. Both were great to listen, but I would like to ask you what the EU will do to remain, uh, to retain and further its role of the so-called environmental hegemon, as we know that we cannot sleep on our successes because if we do, others might stop perceiving us as a so-called environmental hegemon. Thank you. I presume this is for both or to whom you would like to address the question? I would love to address it to both speakers because thank I you. think, thank, thank you. you. State Secretary. Um, oh, well, uh, thank you. I think it's a good question. And I believe that uh, the EU has, uh, like also Clément uh, said uh, in his introduction, uh, in there are many uh, areas where EU can lead and uh, environment is only one uh, of those uh, areas and i think it, it's very difficult process because we have very ambitious targets and to implement them will require uh, tough reforms but also transition economic transition this is very difficult for political reasons social reasons all other reasons but I think the EU has a good potential because with the funds and not sharing the principle of sharing knowledge, uh, the EU can of course influence the development and by investing more in new technologies, by supporting research, by also maybe attracting young uh, talents. We see how uh, the United States are successful when it comes to attracting young talents. Basically, we we have the means and I think it's a great potential for the European Union. I, I personally, I think it's one of the uh, very, one, one of the most important topics for the Conference of the Future of Europe when we are speaking about pol developing policies for future. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Thank you. I, I, I like the, the just, uh, expression of the phrase of um, environmental hegemon. I think it's what we are. And um, we have demonstrated it through our objectives, the goals that Gasper was recalling. And carbon neutrality by 2050, we are the first in the world to set it as an objective. Minus 55% collectively in 2030. Probably no other region in the world is going that far. It's such a, a big economy, a big market. Um, so we are clearly leading. Now we have to do, I think, two types of things. First, to not just to set objectives, but to make sure we are delivering and to have uh, actions to reach the objectives. That's the whole purpose of the so-called Green Deal in the EU. And it's a bit late because of COVID, the debate was uh, a bit stopped or slowed down, but we will have a lot of uh, legislation, pieces of legislation now being uh, discussed and voted in the coming months to make sure sector by sector, like car emissions, uh, plastic, so on, that we are, on, in line with these uh, objectives uh, as EU and country by country, which will be a difficult debate. We will have it again in the spring, uh, but uh, we need now to, to, to implement. And the second thing is that we need also to make sure we are not just leading by example, but uh, making sure other powers, other big economies are following us. Uh, I think if the EU had not been united and leading, we would not have had the Paris Agreement. Uh, if the EU had not been uh, defending strongly this climate ambition, we, have, we would have lost the Paris Agreement after Mr. Trump withdrew the US. Now they are coming back. 
good. Uh, so, but we are only less than 10% of uh, the global emissions in the as EU. Uh, so if we are not through diplomacy, mainly trying to come to make the others come on these same objectives, we will not succeed. And we also beyond diplomacy have to develop tools which make sure we are uh, incentivizing or sometimes sanctioning others if they are not as ambitious as we are in the climate area. That's the whole idea, not being too long, but just to mention it, of uh, this uh, carbon adjustment mechanism at EU borders that we should develop in the coming months, I, I think, to make sure that uh, when we are reducing our emissions in the EU, we are not re-importing them through uh, trade with other economies which are not submitted to the same ambitions and rules. I think it's very important. It's fair because it's unacceptable for our companies, our citizens to make these efforts and not the others. And it's efficient because if we don't do that, we will just reduce 10% of the global emissions, but not the rest around. So we should uh, do our homework and uh, lead others to follow uh, more or less nicely <laughs> through this type of tools. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we have uh, five more questions and it remained uh, basically three minutes, but the uh, State Secretary said that we, we can prolong for, uh, let's say, five minutes, seven minutes, because uh, not to disappoint our young uh, audience. What I do propose is to take two questions and then two, three questions uh, together. Uh, and uh, please, uh, first two questions together, we will take Lan Horvatic, uh, Horvat Kovac and then Dr. S uh, Suai Nilian Achkilan, uh, they two together. Please first, Lan, and then Dr. Suai. Yes, hi. Um, my question is actually directed to both the uh, speakers. Um, but you have you have kind of answered it, but, but I'd still like to continue on. Um, you say that we need to be a leader in the world, but um, we have recently increased the targets made by the European Green Deal. Um, but these are actually still only promises and only a handful of European Union countries are abiding by them. And um, my question is, do you believe that it is perhaps time to cut our losses, stop making future goals and start working on factual changes, putting pressure on all EU countries to actually step in line with these goals uh, instead of the commission making promises for 10, 20, 30 years in the future. Thank you, Dr. Sue. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question regarding with the COVID-19 and especially the age of post-truth and uh, mobilization of misinformation across the uh, world and especially the European countries because uh, we saw uh, interesting global reflexes through this COVID-19. I would like to ask what will be their opinion for two ministers, how they see this misinformation and disinformation uh, age will affect the future of Europe in uh, soon. Okay, first is about green uh, targets, I think, and second about the misinforma misinformation. Please, uh, uh, State Secretary. Very, very shortly, I, I do share the view that it is, of course, uh, not only to set high targets, but also to deliver on, on uh, high goals. And I think uh, this will be, of course, a major task for both of our presidencies, but also for the, the European Commission. Um, this will all come through various uh, legislative proposals with uh, uh, requiring also implementation. But we, as I said, we have also um, allocated quite a lot of funds and we aim to ensure economic transition. And this goes hand in hand with, with the aim to achieve, to achieve that targets. And uh, we definitely are eager uh, to work on this, uh, but uh, as, I, as I already explained, it is difficult uh, because it requires uh, a lot of uh, changes, uh, social changes, political changes, uh, but uh, it, it, is, it is an inevitable process that will follow. With respect to the COVID, I think uh, it, it's not only COVID, it's also uh, all other um, issues. I think fake news or disinformation, it's something that with the with, especially with the social media and the democratization of communication channels has become uh, a fact and uh, a huge challenge. 
uh, we have seen that uh, with with tweeters um, we we see how uh, basically the the the, the border borderline blurs between politicians and journalists and journalists and politicians because basically everybody interacts with with each other and media picks up an information and presents uh, or in, uh, provides an uh, interpretation of that information and of course this goes around and at the end of the day nobody really knows what what was the original fact this is a huge problem i think for every democracy uh, for Slovenia, this is a particular problem because uh, we are, uh, as a community, a little bit uh, closed, I would say, because of not so many people understand Slovenian and, and uh, all others that, uh, that are following what is going on in Slovenia only in English, English language are dependent on, on what is translated in English and how, or how it is translated in English. So uh, I agree, this is a huge problem, but there is no magic stick to solve, but uh, to fight this information with, with facts. We have another two questions, but please, Mr. Minister, green targets and... Uh, no, just uh, very quickly on the green targets, you're right that uh, we just we don't need just to have these targets and uh, nice objectives, but we need to deliver and to make sure we have measures to reach them and to act now. Uh, I think this is what's our legislation already is about so i just take one example uh, the reduction of or the ban of some plastics for instance maybe it's not quick enough but we have common eu rules now by 2025 if i'm correct to ban a lot of um, plastics we use in our everyday life it's concrete and it helps uh, for instance emissions for the car industry uh, they will be strengthened but the targets of reduction are already introduced in the legislation for eu and they are st quite strict and they are implemented in national legislation and uh, they will increase the level of emission reductions in the years to come so it's not only the big objectives for 2030 2050 it's uh, it's current uh, legislation and even when you have a target for 2030 you actually need to take the measures now to reach them so i i agree now we should concentrate uh, on that just on i agree on disinformation misinformation it's probably the big challenge of uh, our democratic debates for the years to come uh, probably it's an area in which, uh, in terms of security, we can do a lot of EU cooperation because we are facing the same challenges. Uh, we have the competencies and the technical skills, experts and so on of cybersecurity in Europe. Um, and uh, we have a good opportunity to do something concrete about defense and security in the broadest sense in this area. I don't know if it's a European agency of experts sharing information, being more active, fighting cyber attacks and so on, but we should clearly strengthen this and not only on a, on a national basis, but in the EU, we are still too uh, naive and nice about this, I would say. In all our electoral processes, we saw that in France, we saw that in a lot of EU countries, we have interferences, attacks, and we should strengthen our skills, number of experts, money and some resources, to, to fight this and not just to uh, ask the US to do it for us. I think we, we would need to do it as Europeans. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have two questions uh, more and please do uh, it in a very concentrated uh, manner. First, Irnea Staric. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, bonjour, Monsieur le Ministre. I have a question. Uh, you talked about um, common values, European common values. But um, maybe a bit more specifically, how far away do you think we are from uh, from the from realizing kind of the seventh article of the uh, Treaty of the European Union, or maybe how how long will the EU kind of put up or tolerate the deviations uh, from the common values? Maybe not how far literally, but metaphorically, maybe. Thank you. Okay, and the second is Spela Abram, please. Yes, hello. I have a question for the French minister. Um, the uh, French President Macron in November posted an ultimatum to the Muslim re religious groups in France to sign the Republican Values Char Charter. What was the planned action if they chose not to conform to it? And how do you see this issue in broader means of EU integration, having this specific religious minority integration issue on interior level of the bare and also core of democratic postulates. Thank you. 
Okay, first was, uh, I suppose, on the rule of law, and uh, I will just add uh, those of the uh, ministers uh, whether this issue can, uh, uh, obviously, we have some sort of, uh, between brackets, dual understanding of the uh, 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 rule of law uh, or common European values, and whether this can be an obstacle for the uh, strengthening of the European Union in the future. And the second was about the religious minorities. I think uh, the, the new legislation that France introduced or presented uh, there, please, uh, 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 Mr. Minister. Yes, maybe on the second question. First, we are, it's not voted yet in both chambers of our parliament, but we are introducing a new legislation with a, a set of different rules. But the basic idea is to uh, make sure we strengthen our sometimes difficult to understand or to explain, but principle of laicity, uh, as we call it, which is about uh, finding a place for each religion, or each religious minority, uh, as sometimes it's caricature. It's not uh, a ban, of course, of any belief, religion, or whatever. On the contrary, it's a guarantee. But we have this sometimes specific vision that in some uh, public spaces, school and so on, you need uh, strict common rules to make sure that uh, the coexistence is possible. And we have seen, it could be very long, but to be very short, we have seen recently, not only in France, obviously, but the development of a lot of uh, communities which are close to each other in a way. And this is about trying to avoid this, making sure, for instance, and when you have radicalized associations promoting not uh, a religion, but a political approach against the law of the country, uh, Islamist groups, for instance, uh, you are able to sanction them, uh, to dissolve associations, for instance, and we are basically strengthening these rules. Uh, in the same spirit as we have all, always followed of, of this laicite, uh, also because we do have an issue, probably more in France than in a lot of other EU countries, of radicalized groups trying to promote their activities through different channels, associations, social communities, and so on. So we are trying basically to, uh, to tackle this. On the value issue, it again, could be a, a long uh, discussion and debate. I don't, believe, I don't believe we have the tools to go as far as we should. Uh, I think you mentioned Article 7 of the treaty. It's a political procedure, which I think is useful because it puts pressure, to put it simply. Uh, but we need all the tools which are more concrete, more direct, and not taken hostage in a way by unanimity voting, like the regulation I was mentioning on conditionality between money and rule of law respects. And I think we should probably, uh, base, on the basis of this regulation, extend this principle. Again, not to target one or two or three or four countries, I don't know, uh, but because if we weaken these values, I think your generation and beyond, beyond, beyond your generation, people will not understand why we are together, basically. So I, I, I do think we should be very tough on this. Do we have a dual understanding in the European Union? Sorry? Dual understanding East-West on basic values? Frankly, I don't think so. And I, I'm never in this debate of uh, East-West. First, because I think it's not because one or two countries are in this process that it's an Eastern issue. I think it would be silly and unfair to present it like that. And even more important when you are French, I say to my fellow citizens, it's not a Polish issue or Hungarian issue, meaning that we are safe and they are bad. It's a common issue and it can happen, these LGBT attacks, these uh, Redu reduction of rights, attack on abortion rights, and so on. It can happen everywhere, not north or south, east or west. So we have to protect it for Europe as a group. Okay, thank you, Mr. Minister. State Secretary on values. Um, yeah, Rule indeed. Um, um, well, uh, it's a very delicate question, I would say. Uh, we have uh, now opened uh, those procedure under Article 7 for quite some time against two countries. Um, there were a lot of debates, and like, like uh, Clement said, it's political debate. There are various opinions whether this goes uh, or leads to, 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 to convergence on how we see common values. 
there are also doubts whether this procedure really um, enables us to converge. Uh, we have both listened to those debates, how, how they, they are um, um, uh, tackled in, in the Council for General Affairs. And uh, personally, I, I, I'm very glad that we have established more concrete uh, mechanisms that can target and more easily um, somehow focus or divide political questions from, from legal questions, or financial questions from political questions. And I think we, we need uh, those supplementary uh, mechanisms um, that has to ensure, of course, equal treatment. Uh, and of course, also uh, certain understanding for maybe different uh, traditions. Um, I don't know, because speaking from, from uh, as, as a representative from a country that has also, um, the, uh, let's say, shorter to the, the democratic tradition than Western Europeans, of course, there are some differences. But I agree that when it comes to um, common values, we have to find uh, ways uh, to converge. And I think we have, uh, in the meantime, uh, a lot of instruments. We have infringement procedures when it comes to um, Article 14 and discrimination, or maybe some other very important European principles. Uh, we have um, rule of law uh, reports they are maybe too general to really address all the issues, uh, but it's the first step, it's a good step. We have now a special regulation that will also ensure more, more better surveillance when it comes to spending European money. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's a good start. Uh, and personally, I believe that uh, those, uh, let's say legal ways can um, also help to ensure uh, convergence on, on this principal value. Sometimes, even though uh, here, our opinion may be a little bit different, Clement said, of course, those debates create political pressure. But on the other hand, sometimes they also serve certain political needs. And you never know whether you're really targeting what you want or just um, continuing uh, and helping the narrative um, to, to um, somehow live on. So it's a delicate question, I would say, but this is uh, the fact the procedure is open, it's, uh, it is running, uh, and it's, uh, the decisions are taken unanimous. And since you have to, um, an open procedure against two countries, it's basically impossible to, <laughs> uh, uh, let's say, conclude. Uh, the way it is meant to, um, it what is what what we can do is of course to to see what uh, how we can proceed and how and to uh, assess whether we have with those additional elements uh, somehow supplemented uh, and ensured convergence and if not we can of course continue uh, those discussions and uh, see whether there's progress under, our, uh, under the, the Article 7 or not. But I hope this is very, um, as I said, sensitive issues that also the Conference on the Future of Europe will also address these kind of questions, um, which are of utmost important for, for future. Thank you. And clearly it shows us that values are not just merely part of the negotiating chapters, closing and, uh, and opening. Uh, and, uh, uh, and probably uh, not enough uh, uh, for just merely negotiation during the uh, accession uh, process, obviously. Uh, we're, we had today basically the first Slovenian debate uh, uh, for the new conference on future of Europe. I'm very glad that the French minister uh, Bonn uh, joined us together with State Secretary uh, uh, Dojan. Uh, what can we say? Uh, we, we covered very interesting uh, uh, questions from the audience uh, regarding the youth participation, security, radicalization, European values, uh, environment, uh, 
Green Deal targets, uh, uh, health and COVID uh, disinformation campaign, uh, values, uh, and uh, also re uh, religion uh, uh, minorities uh, uh, in France. Very interesting debate. But uh, really, it's important because to engage European Union citizens on the future uh, of Europe debate is probably the best antidote for nationalisms and populisms in the European Union. And why this is important? This is important because in 20, 2024, the new uh, uh, European elections uh, will happen. And that's why the European debate on, on open debate is of utmost importance for all of us. But on the other side, the results based on the will of citizens, I do recommend should be respected and implemented. Otherwise, uh, the disillusion might lead to uh, another uh, setback, which we, we hope not. Uh, um, I would like to thank both uh, ministers and the audience for the questions. And again, I would like to remind you that we will continue with the BLED strategic serious talks on the future of Europe in forthcoming months uh, uh, further. And uh, that also this year edition of the BLED strategic forum, which will happen on the 1st and 2nd September, will be devoted to the future of Europe debate. And it is entitled the future uh, of Europe. Uh, and of course, I do hope that I will see Mr. Bond also in BLED uh, uh, since the debate uh, I'm sure it will be very, very uh, interesting. I would like for the end, thank to our fantastic center uh, of European uh, 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 perspective uh, and the BLED Strategic Forum, both of two teams for a fantastic work for today. Uh, again, ministers, thank you, audience, thank you. And many thanks uh, to all our collaborators. Thank you very much and goodbye.